Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah Jazakum Allah khairan for your attendance um, We're going to continue with the story of the Prophet Musa alayhi salam Musa alayhi salam, he was given a speech to his people He was given a, a khutbah, he was given a talk to his people Until his people were shedding their tears They were shedding tears and their hearts became tender They became soft And such was the da'wah of the prophets That it would reach the heart it would reach the heart, heart of the people. And this is something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed the prophets with. So the people were moved by the speech Musa alayhi was giving. And one of the people said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, is there anybody more knowledgeable than you? Is there anybody who is more knowledgeable than you? And Musa alayhi he knew that he was Kalimullah. He was the one who spoke to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on many occasions. He was a messenger of Allah. Who could be more knowledgeable? Who would thought that would have been? Who would have thought there would be somebody more knowledgeable than Musa alayhi salam? So he said no. That basically I am the most knowledgeable person on this earth at this time. He wasn't doing it to show off, but he was a messenger of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa taala reprimanded him because he didn't ascribe the knowledge, all knowledge to Allah. So he was told that there is somebody more knowledgeable than you. So Musa alayhi salam, when he was when he was informed that there's somebody more knowledgeable than him, he was interested, he was intrigued. He said, oh my Lord, where is he? Where is this person? You know, I want to meet this person. I want to learn from this person. Where can I meet this person? Look at this. Musa al-Islam was the messenger of Allah. From Ulul Azmi min al-Rusul, from the five greatest messengers of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he was from the five best people that ever stood on this earth whoever came onto this earth he hears that there's somebody who has more knowledge about him than him now he wants to go and learn and find his person and learn from him so he asked that how can I find him and she that how can I find him oh my lord tell me of a sign whereby I shall recognize the place so he's asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where can I meet this person? Allah said, take a dead fish. Take a dead fish. And the place where it becomes alive, that's where it's going to be. So it's at the junction between, at the junction of two seas. And he was told the sign is going to be that you have a dead fish. Take a dead fish with you. When that fish becomes alive, that's the place where this person is going to be. So in Surah 18, verse 60, it says, and remember when Musa said to his boy servant, I will not give up traveling until I reach the junction of the two seas or until I spend years and years in traveling. So Musa -Islam was accompanied by, by his boy servant. And the boy servant was called Yusha bin Nun. Yusha bin Nun, later on, he becomes a prophet. And I will, inshallah, I think the week after next week, I will speak about his life. Yusha bin Nun. At the moment, he is um, the boy servant of Musa alayhi salam. He is learning from Musa alayhi salam. He's learning from his teacher. He's learning the etiquette. He's learning wisdom. He's learning from the fountain of prophethood. He literally became a prophet. Musa alayhi salam said, I will not give up traveling, you know, even if I have to spend years and years in traveling. So I will not give up. This mission, even if I spend years and years in traveling, he wants to meet this person who has more knowledge or different knowledge to Musa alayhi salam and he's prepared to travel years and years. And in this we learn a lesson which is to travel for knowledge is a great, great nikmah and it's very, very rewarding where a person, he knows there's a talk in this, um, in this town somewhere or in this country somewhere and he travels for nothing else except to learn some knowledge from a scholar or to learn some knowledge that he doesn't have then it's such a blessing and it's such a virtuous act in Islam and Musa al -Islam here is prepared to spend years and years in traveling and remember Musa al -Islam is a prophet of Allah if he's prepared to spend years and years traveling then what about what about us and some of the scholars said the two seas were the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea where they meet where they meet this was the point and Allah knows best. So it's continued in the Quran, verse 61. But when they reached the junction of the two seas, they forgot their fish. And it took its way through the sea as in a tunnel. 
So what happened is as they were traveling, they reached a rock. And Musa Islam, he lay down and he fell asleep. And the fish, it woke up. It became alive. And it made its way into the sea, making a tunnel behind it. So it's mentioned in, I think it's in uh, Hadith in Bukhari, it's mentioned that the, Allah SWT made the water um, still, you know, behind the fish as the fish was going. So the water became still immediately behind the fish. So it made this strange tunnel, look, look like a tunnel because the water was still. So it made its way into the sea in a strange way as there was a tunnel behind it, making a tunnel behind it. And Yusha bin Noon saw it. He saw it, he witnessed the fish going into the water in the strange way. Musa alayhi salam was asleep. But what happened is Yusha bin Nun, the boy servant, he forgot. He forgot. Such a miracle. Such a miracle happened in front of his eyes and he forgot. And he was better than you and me. He became a prophet later on. So what do we learn from this? Forgetting is a, a, natural, a natural thing that happens to humans. We forget. There's always going to be many times in our life where we forget. If we see a brother or a sister, a family member, a friend, a cousin, who we told something long time ago or even something yesterday, and they forget, let's not destroy them and say, how could you have forgot something that simple? It's impossible how you could have forgot that thing. Such a big thing that happened, how could you forget? If they do say that, let them tell them the story about Yusha bin Noon, how he forgot. And if you remember the first talk I did, how Adam alayhi salam forgot such a big thing. And forgetting is human nature. We, so we shouldn't like ridicule and we shouldn't really, you know, be hard on people who forget. They simply forgot. I'm sorry, brother, I forgot. Totally went out of my mind. No problem, brother. This is human nature. So he forgot such a big thing. So they traveled for another day and night. Verse, verse 62. So when they had passed further on, i.e. beyond the fixed place, Musa said to his boy servant, Bring us our morning meal. Truly we have suffered much fatigue in this our journey. So the Prophet ﷺ said that Musa Islam didn't feel tired and hungry until this point. When they've gone beyond that point, now Musa Islam felt tired and hungry. Verse 63, he said, You shall be known, the boy servant, he said, Do you remember when we betook ourselves to the rock? I indeed forgot the fish. None but shaitan made me forget to remember it. It took its course into the sea in a strange way. So he, you shall be known that boy is telling Musa Islam that remember when we, we took a rest by that rock? Well, at that time, the fish actually became alive and went into the sea. But shaitan made me forget. So Musa Islam, verse 64. Musa Islam says, Musa Islam said, That is what we have been seeking. So they went back retracing their footsteps. So this is what they wanted. This is the sign that they wanted. So they went back to um, the place where the fish disappeared. When they got to that place, they saw a man lying down, a person lying down, lying down under some clothes. So he's lying down, this person. And this person was Khidr, Khidr al-Islam. Khidr, so there's three ways of pronouncing this as far as I know. One is Khadr, one is Khadr, and one is Khidr. <coughs> I'm going to say Khidr because that's the one I'm used to. So Khidr, al-Islam, was a person who was lying down under those, um, those clothes. And it's mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the roof meaning of which is Khidr, basically what it means is green. Green is, you know, in Arabic, Khidr means green. And it's mentioned in a hadith that he, he was sitting down on some white fur and when he got up, it became green. So that's why he's given the name Khidr. So Khidr means green. So basically Khidr, when he woke up, he, he was there, he saw Musa a.s. He said, who are you? Musa a.s. greeted him and said, I am Musa. So Khidr a.s. he knew of a Musa. He's heard of a Musa. He has knowledge of somebody called Musa, the Musa of Bani Israel, the leader of Bani Israel. So he asked him, are you the Musa of Bani Israel? Are you that one? Are you that Musa? He said, yes. Okay, so already we know that Khidr al-Islam, you know, knows some things. Whether he had heard it from the people 
or whether he, uh, he had been told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knew the name Musa. Verse 66, Musa said to him, May I follow you so that you may teach me something of that knowledge which you have been taught? Can I accompany you? Can I be your student and can I learn from you? Look at the humbleness of Musa alayhi salam. And in order for somebody to learn from another person, he has to be humble. Otherwise, he's never going to learn. You know, I have a teacher who taught me Arabic and he's younger than me. If I think, oh, he's younger than me and why should I learn from him and I'm older than him, how can this be? You know, no, no, I've got pride inside myself. <laughs> Not learning from him, I'm going to learn from an old sheikh somewhere. <laughs> right? That's bad. We're not going to learn like that until we humble ourselves. We be humble and we learn of somebody who might even be a child. He might be teaching us Tajweed and he's a child, but he knows Tajweed and we don't. There's no problem, there's no... There's no, um, there's no shame in learning from somebody who is younger than you, um, so long as he has some knowledge that you don't have. So Musa al -Islam is humbling himself, he's becoming humble and learning this knowledge from another prophet. Verse 67, he, Khidr, said, Verily you will not be able to have patience with me. You're not going to be patient with me. Khidr is telling, uh, Khidr is telling Musa al -Islam, you want to accompany me with me? and learn knowledge from me, but you're not going to be patient with me. You're not going to be able to have patience with me. 68. And how can you have patience about something which you know not? So basically, Khidr al-Islam, he said, O Musa, I have knowledge of Allah that you don't have, and you have knowledge from Allah that I don't have. So they were both combined with the most knowledgeable people on the earth. Verse 69. Musa said, rough meaning, Musa said, you will find me, if Allah wills, patient, and I will not disobey you in any order. So Musa is telling him that I will be patient. You know, I will be patient. I, will, I want to stay with you, and I, I will be patient. He, Khidr, said, Then, if you follow me, ask me not about anything till I myself mention it to you. So Khidr is giving the Prophet Musa a condition. If you want to stay with me, if you want to follow me, if you want to learn from me, then don't ask me about anything until I tell you myself. You have to stay quiet and don't ask me anything. You, you know, there's going to be strange things happening, but you have to stay quiet. That's the condition. Musa al Islam, obviously, he agreed. So the first, the first lesson, um, they basically saw a bird. A bird had some water on its beak, water from the ocean had some water it basically dipped its beak in the water of the ocean and now it's come out and it has a bit of water on its beak so he said by Allah my knowledge and your knowledge besides Allah's knowledge is like that water that is on the beak of the bird right that has taken from the ocean so like the ocean you know this our knowledge is so small and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's ocean is like the sea compared to, and it's not even comparison, but our knowledge is so small and Allah subhanahu wa knowledge is you know, vaster than the sea and the ocean. So he's teaching Musa al Islam this. And if you think about it, you know, Allah subhanahu wa knowledge is infinite. And our knowledge, Musa al Islam's knowledge, Khidr al Islam's knowledge, the most knowledgeable people on the earth, their knowledge is like just the water on the beak. And Allah subhanahu wa knowledge is the ocean. I no comparison. There's no comparison. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge is infinite. So if the prophets had such a small amount of knowledge from the knowledge that Allah had given them, then how can we question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes something happen to us? When we go and do something and something doesn't happen the way we wanted it to. You know, somebody comes and we have an accident or we have something or we are not like that person who we wanted to be, or we don't, we don't, we're not rich, we're not millionaires, whatever. How can then we start questioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Why I don't understand, why me? Or we're told something in Islam that this is how you're supposed to do it, and we say, Why I don't understand, it doesn't fit my head, I don't understand. Why do we have to do it like this when nobody else is doing it? It doesn't make sense. How much knowledge do we have compared to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We have we know nothing. We know nothing. Ah, how can the Jannah, how can this, how can we don't have any knowledge compared to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So whatever knowledge Allah SWT has given us, we have to understand that this is just a fraction of all knowledge. It's nothing. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided for us a certain thing, or decided for us a certain way, or has decided that Islam, in Islam it says do this like this, at this time, we should do it without questioning, because we have no... You cannot encompass anything of the knowledge except what Allah wants you to encompass. So, and we read this Ayatul Kursi, it's in Ayatul Kursi, we read this every after every fourth salah, or it's good to, sunnah to, we can't encompass anything of the knowledge of Allah except what He wants us to understand. So how much more does He know than we? And then how can we complain to Allah SWT, I don't understand why have you done it to me, I don't understand why. You know, so we shouldn't have this when we realize the infinite knowledge of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. He knows what would have happened if you asked for what you got. He knows what would have happened if you wanted how you got it like that. He knows what would have happened. He knows what is best for you to be like you are in the situation that you are for yourself. It's better for you. So it's mentioned in verse 71. So they both proceeded till when they embarked the ship. So what happened is Musa alayhi salam, Khidr alayhi salam, they came to the coast and they came to the sea. Um, there were some people there who had a ship and they offered to give Khidr alayhi salam a lift. They knew him, so they offered to give them a free lift. So they gave him a free lift to the other coast. They were giving him a lift while the sailors were busy, while the sailors were busy doing what they, they were doing. Khidr alayhi salam, he pulled out a plank of the wood from the boat, from the ship. He, pull, he damaged it. He damaged it. He pulled out a plank of wood and he damaged the ship. Okay, verse 71. It says, He, I Khidr, scuttled it. Musa al Islam said, Have you scuttled it in order to drown its people? Verily, you have committed an evil thing. Why have you done this? These people have given us a lift. They have been so generous to us, so kind to us. And you just destroyed and damaged their boat. So Musa al Islam couldn't keep this in. Verse 72. He, Khidr, said, Did I not tell you that you would not be able to have patience with me? He's reminding Musa al Islam that remember I told you you wouldn't be able to have patience with me. But Musa al Islam, the Prophet وسلم, said that Musa al Islam, he forgot the first time. He genuinely forgot that, oh yes, I wasn't supposed to ask Musa al Islam any questions. I wasn't supposed to question him. I should just continue watching what he's doing and learning from him. But he forgot. So again, Musa al Islam forgot. So we, we, we forget, people forget. Verse 73, Musa said, Call me not to account for what I forgot, and be not hard upon me for my affair. Like basically, let me off. You know, I didn't realize, I forgot. Let me off. Let me still accompany you. Let me still stay with you. So, Khidr al Islam accepted. Khidr al Islam let Musa al Islam continue. When they reached the shore, they saw, you know, kids, they saw kids playing. Khidr al Islam, he got a boy and he killed him. Took his head off, killed him. Verse 74 Musa al Islam said, Have you killed an innocent person who killed none? Have you killed somebody, an innocent person who never killed anybody? Verily, you have committed a great evil. Khidr al Islam said, The next verse. Did I not tell you that? Um, did I not tell you that you can have no patience with me? Did I not tell you this before that you won't be able to have any patience with me? Now this time, Musa al Islam hadn't forgot. He remembered, but after he'd seen this, what looked like a crime, he couldn't stay quiet. Remember Musa al Islam when when he saw some evil happening, he wouldn't just he wouldn't let it by. Remember when Musa al Islam saw those two women, uh, and they were on the sidelines because the men were getting the water. He couldn't see that. He couldn't see that injustice happening, so he went and intervened. So we know this is the characteristic of Musa al Islam. He see, he's seen Khidr al Islam kill this boy. It's like he knows now, he remembers not to question Khidr al Islam, but he intervened because he couldn't see this thing happen. He didn't understand why this is happening. So when Khidr al Islam told him, Did I tell you you won't have patience with me? Verse 76 Musa said, If I ask you anything after this, keep me not in your company. You have received an excuse from me. So Musa al Islam is saying, one more chance, one more chance. If I ask you again, if I question you again, then we part ways. Then just give me one last chance. So Khidr al Islam, 
he accepted. So what happened is they went to a town, they went to a village, a place, and they asked the people for some food. Can we have some food? But the people were so stingy, so stingy that they're not even going to provide a traveler some food. Even in Islam, we know that when we have guests for three days, we provide for them. After that, we can do, you know, we can continue or we can, you know, we don't have, we don't have to provide for them after that. So these people, they came, uh, sorry, these people refused Khidr al-Islam, Musa al-Islam, to give them any food. So stingy, stingy people. And then as, you know, so as Khidr al-Islam, Musa al-Islam were going away, they saw a wall that was about to collapse. There's a wall, maybe has some cracks in it, it's about to collapse. So Khidr al-Islam, he built it up and made it strong. So that's a bit, appears a bit strange that, that these people didn't even offer us any food and you're making a wall for them. You're repairing, you know, a wall that's about to fall down. You're repairing it for them. Verse 77, part of it, Musa said, if you had wished, surely you could have taken wages for it. This is what Musa al-Islam said, that you could have taken a payment for this. You know, they've not given us any food. You could have taken a payment. You've just built their wall for them. But this was the last, this was the last three chances have gone. Verse 78, Khidr said, this is the parting between me and you. I will tell you the interpretation of those things over which you are unable to hold patience. So Khidr is saying, that's it. Our time is over. I ask you to stay patient, not to ask me the questions, but three times you have done it. And the last time you gave me a last chance, you gave yourself a last chance, I gave you a last chance. And now it's complete, it's done. So we part ways. But before you go, I'm going to tell you why I did those things that you saw me do. Verse 79. And by the way, this story appears in Surah Al-Kahf. It comes in Surah Al-Kahf, which is the, which is verse uh, which is um, Surah 18, I think, which is the surah that we are told to read every Fridays in the Sunnah. The Prophet Sallallahu encouraged, encouraged us to read Surah Al-Kahf every Fridays. And this story occurs in Surah Al-Kahf. So we might sit down and think, why have, we been, why have we been told to go over this story every week? What's the reason? What's the benefits? What's the lessons we can learn? So that's something to think about. So Khidr al-Islam, verse 79, he says, As for the ship, it belonged to Masakin, poor people, working in the sea. So I wished to make a defective damage in it as there was a king behind them who seized every ship by force. So now Khidr al-Islam is telling Musa al-Islam the wisdom that this ship it belonged to Miskeen, poor people. What we can learn from this also, a poor person, look how, how expensive would a ship be? It might be quite expensive, it might be worth quite a lot. It belonged to these poor people. How can a person who owns a ship or a boat, how can he be poor? How can he be a miskeen when he owns such a, a vessel, a ship? So the reason why they can be poor is because they might have, you know, a ship, but the livelihood that they're earning is just about, they're still poor because they're just about making ends meet or they're struggling to make ends meet even though they own, you know, a ship. So it might be that somebody has a car. It might be somebody has a house. And he appears to be fine, but that car is enabling him to go to work and make that small living that he comes back, then he pays the rent and he pays the bill and he's still struggling. He could still be a miskeen, although he has all he has a house and he has like a car, doesn't mean he's he's rich now. He could still be a poor person because those things that he has are a means for him to earn a livelihood, but that livelihood is not enough to meet his needs. So he could still be poor. So these people had a ship, but they were still called miskeen. And he made a defective damage. He made a damage in the boat, in the ship. Why? Because there's a king and he seizes ships by force. There's a king living around here or in the area. And he's after any ship that looks good. Any ship that is got looking nice and looking fantastic and looking good, he will take it. He will take it and keep it himself. So if he saw the ship of the Miskeen, which was their livelihood, if he saw it in a nice way, he would have taken this ship from them. So Khidr al-Islam, he made a defect, defect in it. He took out a plank. So when the king sees the ship, he'll say, ah, oh, forget this one, you guys keep this. 
I'm not interested in this ship, just keep it, I don't want this one. So what did Khidr al-Islam end up doing? By plucking out the, um, the wood from the boat, he ended up saving the ship for them. So it looked bad, but it was good. And this we also learn another principle in Islam, which is sometimes you only have a choice of very bad or bad. There's only two choices. There's no, there's no other, you have to take a decision between two things. There's no other choice. Either something, you do something very bad or you do something that's slightly bad. And in this case, plucking out a, you know, a plank from the ship is bad, but he's, he's saving them from something that's very bad. So there's a principle in Islam that you sometimes, if you're faced with two evils, you do the lesser of the two evils. You do the lesser of the two evils. Okay. Verse 80. As for the boy. As for the boy, his parents were believers. And we feared lest he should oppress them by rebellion and disbelief. So basically, his parents, were this, the person who... the who was killed, the boy who was killed, his parents were believers. Uh, it's mentioned in the next verse actually says, so we intended that their Lord should change him for them, for one, better in righteousness and, nearness, and nearer to mercy. So basically, this boy, he was going to grow, grow up to be an evil, a bad person, and he would, you know, force his parents to go that way and become evil and bad. So Allah SWT commanded Khidr al-Islam to take his life. And it was to save his parents. Now imagine his parents would have come back and seen who has done this to our child. And they might have been so disappointed and so sad and so worried and what's going to happen. But they don't know that through that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saving them. Now we have to remember Khidr al-Islam wasn't a normal person. You can't go out and just kill anybody like this. But this is a story of the Prophet Khidr al-Islam who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had instructed to do certain actions. So this was, this was the wisdom behind this one. Verse 82, he said, As for the wall, it belonged to two orphan boys in the town, and there was under it a treasure belonging to them, and their father was a righteous man. And your Lord intended that they should attain their age of full strength and take out their treasure as a mercy from your Lord. And I did them, sorry, and I did them not of my own accord. That is the interpretation of those things over which you could not hold patience. So Khidr al-Islam is saying that I repaired that wall because behind it was a treasure that belonged to the orphans. If that wall had come down and the treasure became revealed, do you think those people who never offered them any food would just leave that treasure by itself and say, no, 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 that belongs to the orphans, keep it there? No, 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 no. They would have taken that treasure and they would have kept it and it would have been finished for the orphans so when the orphans became older there would have been no money for them or no or no treasure for them whatever that was so it's mentioned though and their father was a righteous man why did Allah SWT mention and their father was a righteous man the father was righteous so through that action Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looked after his children so if we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to look after our children, then what we do is we have to try and make sure we do good deeds. And through our good deeds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will look after our children. So this was the completion of the story of um, the Prophet Musa al-Islam meeting Khidr al-Islam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said regarding this story, he said, we wish that Musa could have remained patient so that Allah would have, you know, told us more of this story. So we wish that Musa al-Islam would remain patient, more patient, so that Allah SWT would have told us more of this story. So it was an amazing story, but this is all the knowledge we had of this story. And the lesson, the main lesson, I only have 10 minutes because the recording is going to finish. Okay, but the main lesson of this story is, Allah SWT says in the Quran, وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُوا شَيْءٌ وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ وَعَسَىٰ أَن تُحِبُّوا شَيْءٌ وَهُوَ شَرٌ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it may, be that you dis uh, it may be that you dislike a thing which is good for you and it may, it may be that you like a thing which is bad for you and Allah knows but you do not know 
This verse is re revealed regarding jihad. The full verse is, jihad is ordained for you, though you dislike it. And it may be that you dislike a thing which is good for you, and it may be that you like a thing which is bad for you. And Allah knows, and you do not know. Roof meaning. But even, not in the context of jihad, just even generally, you know, you might like something that's really bad for you. And you might not like something which is good for you. You may have had a little accident on your car. And you think, oh, why the accident? Why me? Why this? Why that? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved you with a little clip of a car. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved you from a bigger problem that would have happened to you a few streets down the road if you hadn't stopped there and attended to that little bump that you had. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's best for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts us under trial and we don't know that because of that trial we are becoming stronger and better and stronger as a believer. And then when this future test comes upon us, we're all ready. We're ready for it. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has trained us up. So we may think that there's something bad happening in our life, but really it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is training us up. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is opening a door for us. How many times have we had examples in our life where something bad happened to us? And as a result of that bad thing, some goodness came out that wouldn't have happened otherwise. And there's many people tell stories of they, you know, they got late for a meeting, they had a, they had a flight and they, were, they had to go to a job interview, for example. And uh, that morning, they missed the alarm, they didn't wake up, they were so sad that I missed that job interview, I've missed the opportunity, it's so sad, it's so sad. And then they found out that that plane crashed. What you thought, what you thought was bad for you was really good for you. You missed that flight, you missed that job opportunity, but you ended up being saved from the plane crash. So whenever we are in a bad situation, think of this verse. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me this problem to save me from a bigger problem. Allah Taala has all wisdom and I want to just mention one little example because I only have about five minutes left before the recording ends if the recording ends we'll do the quiz outside of the recording inshallah the other example I just want to give the last example whenever we have a problem in our life ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be patient because it could be the opening of something good I'll give you just a quick example imagine you're a person you're on the you're on a boat somewhere and you you know, the, the waves toss you over, the boat capsizes and you get um, sort of um, pushed by the waves to the shore of a little island. And you wake up on the island and there's nobody there, there's no ships. As far as you can see, there's no boats, there's no ships, there's nothing. You're trapped here, you have no phone, there's no nothing. You are trapped maybe for the rest of your life, that's what you're thinking. And, you know, you're by yourself and you're missing your family and how do you get, you're crying and you don't know how to get out of this situation. And then you think, okay, I'm going to be living here for a bit now, so I need to make a little house for myself because it's cold at night. So you make a little hut for yourself um, so that you can stay in at night. You go looking for food and you're miserable, you're sad, and you go looking for food. One day you go away for a certain amount of time looking for some food. You come back and that hut that you had, that only piece of um, rest that you had, it's, it's um, burned. It's got on fire and it's leaving, you know, it's just all burst up in flames and it's on fire and you look at it and you cry and you think, oh, everything I had, even that house, that little hut I had, has gone, it's finished and you cry and you just go to sleep there. You have no more energy, you just fall asleep. And then you wake up and there's some rescuers and there's a big ship there and there's some rescuers coming to get you and giving you water, giving you food and wrapping you up and saying, come on, let's go. We're on a rescue mission. Let's take you away. And you think, wow. How, how come you guys are here? How come you guys have found me? What happened? How, how come you've rescued me? How did you even know I was here? And they say, we saw your distress signal. The smoke coming from the fire, it rose up high. And that was a distress signal. We knew there's somebody on that island. Let's go and rescue him. So that hut that you saw, you know, going up in flames and you thought, that's the end of me. I'm finished. That's the end of me. That was actually the beginning of your being saved. So whenever we do find ourselves in a situation in this earth, in our life, where we think that's it, it's all finished, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't give you a test that is harder than you can bear. And that end point may be the signal for your goodness to start, for your blessings to start. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to learn from these stories. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to 
you know, think about this story again and take, may Allah SWT enable us to take many lessons from these stories. Jazakumullah khairan. Um, I think I've only got a few minutes. I've only got about three minutes so um, for the recording. So we'll just do what we can, inshallah. So I'll just um, put everybody on, on mute. Okay, so you can unmute yourselves now. So when Musa alayhi salam was asked, are you the most knowledgeable person on the earth? What did he reply? Yeah. Yes, that he's the most knowledgeable because that's he didn't know any of anyone more knowledgeable than him. Allah SWT told him what? Another person. Yes, there's another person who's more knowledgeable and at the junction of the two seas, where the two seas meet, that's where he is. And Musa alayhi salam wanted a sign that how do I know what point what part that person where that person is going to be. So what was the sign he was given? Dead fish. Dead fish. That's it, that'll be a dead fish. Take a dead fish with you. When it becomes alive, that's where the person is going to be. So they went beyond that part and then they came back and they met a person under the clothes. And what was he called? Hizr al-Islam. And he was, I've not gone over it, but he was, the, the, the ulama say he was a prophet because of certain things. I haven't got time to mention them. But okay. And he already knew Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam wanted to follow him. What did Khidr tell him? That he won't be able to be patient with me. Um, but Musa alayhi salam insisted he wanted to stay with him. So Khidr alayhi salam let him stay. And the first place they went to was they went onto a, a ship. And what did Khidr alayhi salam do to that ship? Oh, yeah, he damaged it. And Musa alayhi salam was like, what? Why, have we done, why have we done this? And he told him, did I, did I not tell you you will not be able to be patient with me? Then the next one is, what was the next one? He killed a boy. He killed a boy. Musa alayhi salam, again, this time he remembered, but he, you know, he, um, he couldn't hold back. And Musa alayhi salam told him the same thing. Musa alayhi salam said, if I do it again, then we'll go our own ways. So Khidr al-Islam, he went to a town, he asked people for some food, the people rejected the food, so he saw what, and what did he do? A wall. He saw a wall. He saw a it was a crack, so he rebuilt it. Fantastic, exactly, he rebuilt it. Musa al-Islam said, you could have taken some money for this. Khidr al-Islam said, that's the end of it. That's the end, now we don't um, uh, part ways now. And then what was the reason why did he damage the ship? So the king. Uh, king. Yes, there was a king and he would take all the good ships. So when he sees a damaged ship, he won't take it. So he's actually helping them out. The next one, we only have less than a minute left, I think. The next one was, why did he kill the boy? To save his parents from him. Yeah, to save his parents from the evil that he would have become when he got older. Um, and then the next one is why did he repair the wall? Because it was damaged. Because it was damaged. <laughs>